realize a very good evening everyone welcome to i focus online lecture 240 squint and pediatric ophthalmology series lecture number 27 today we have with us dr manjula jaykumar from agarwal sai hospital chennai talking to us on brown syndrome etiology classification diagnosis and management uh, i request our chair for the evening dr pradeep sharma sir to welcome ma'am and introduce her to our audience thank you shifali it's really a great pleasure and uh, really an honor to be having such a good speaker dr manjula jaykuma she is a really a passionate uh, strabismologist who speaks from her heart and dr manjula jaykuma she has done a do and dnd from shankar netralay chennai she did a fellowship from pediatric ophthalmology strabismus and neuro ophthalmology shankar netralay chennai fico uk Currently, she is a senior consultant and in charge of Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology, Strabismus, and Neuro Ophthalmology at Dr. Agarwal's Eye Hospital, Chennai. She is a passionate teacher who is actively involved in clinical work, research work, and teaching at the institute. She has many awards and accolades, like Ramakrishna Endowment Prize for Best Outgoing Postgraduate, IGO Award for Best Surgical Innovation on Modified Fatin Procedure, Harbinger Award for clinical excellence in pediatric practice instituted by vasan eye care and research center and i star award by dr agarwal's eye hospital research center brown syndrome is really a hard nut to crack and so that's why we have a really a good stalwart in the field of strabismus to crack that hard nut and so over to dr manjula to be talking upon the etiology diagnosis management of brown syndrome dr manjula thank you pradeep sir for such a kind introduction at the outset i would also like to thank dr santosh sir for giving me this opportunity to speak on such an important topic on this particular platform just give me a moment and i will screen share So, yeah. Uh, today I'll be talking to you on Brown syndrome, and as you all know, as ophthalmologists, we are all carried away by syndromes, and strabismus has its own contribution to syndromes. For example, we have the Down's uh, the Duan's retraction syndrome. the sciencia syndrome and the mobius syndrome the list is endless and one of the most interesting syndromes is the brown syndrome which we are going to discuss in detail today i'll be talking to you about the introduction the etiology the associated anomalies the diagnosis the management of brown syndrome so let us look at each one of it in detail as far as brown syndrome is concerned it is a very rare form of syndrome first described by sir herold brown in the 1950s he called it the superior oblique tendon sheath syndrome the reason being he found that the superior oblique tendon sheath had a problem which prevented the superior oblique tendon to move smoothly inside the trochlea therefore he termed it as the so tendon sheath syndrome and it is a distinct clinical entity which is characterized by restriction to both active and passive elevation in adduction so but today we have more amount of information on the etiology of brown syndrome today we know that it is a ccd so what is a ccd congenital cranial disinnervation disorder it's a neurodevelopmental abnormality of the extraocular muscle which is the superior oblique muscle in this case because of which we get congenital abnormalities in the eye movements let us look at it in a little more detail now as you can see here this young boy 
who has a little bit of hypertropia of his right eye with a little XT as limitation of elevation in adduction. This is very clearly seen. So what is does he have? The diagnosis is simple. It is Brown syndrome. This is post-surgical procedure. Initially, I used to do the uh, tendon spacer using the buckle, which no, I no longer do. This is one of my initial cases of Brown syndrome where I have put a scleral buckle as a tendon spacer between the two cupped ends of the superior oblique muscle. And you can see the improvement of elevation adduction. So basically, the key points to the etiology of congenital Brown syndrome is that it is a neurodevelopmental abnormality of the extraocular muscle resulting in abnormal extraocular muscle movement, which is, in fact, a CCDD. Congenital Brown syndrome and congenital superior oblique palsies are very closely related at diabetes. Congenital Brown syndrome can be familiar. You have lid running in families. It can be inherited and it can be associated with other CCDDs. And in a way, it is also related to a congenital superior oblique palsy. So regarding the etiology of congenital Brown syndrome, there are two articles which I would like you to go through. One is in the current opinion of in ophthalmology. Another one is a very interesting uh, contribution by Dr. Seven, which talks about the histology development and the clinical significance as far as superior oblique tendon trochlea complex is concerned in Brown syndrome. So these two will make a real interesting read for postgraduates and practitioners. Now, basically, you have a fourth cranial nerve hypoplasia. Therefore, there is a superior oblique hypoplasia. So these pictures have been taken from current opinion of ophthalmology. Look at this child. She has a Brown syndrome in the right eye. And look at this picture down below in the neuroimaging of the orbit. You feel, you find that the, the superior oblique muscle is hypoplastic or nearly aplastic as compared to the other side. Okay. So the next thing is Brown syndrome can be associated with other CCDs. So what do you see here? There is a Brown syndrome of the right eye, defective elevation of the adduction. There is a limitation of abduction of the left eye. There is a narrowing of palpebral fissure of the left eye and abduction. So this eye, the left eye, has advanced retraction syndrome. The right eye has got a brown syndrome. Brown syndrome itself is a CCD. And it can also be associated with other CCDs in the other eye. Brown syndrome and congenital superior oblique palsy are interrelated at diabetes. Here you find that the little boy has congenital Brown syndrome in the right eye. The father has got a congenital superior oblique palsy. Basically, there is abnormal development of the trochlear nerve or its axon, which is going to cause abnormal development of the superior oblique muscle tendon trochlear complex. If you get a lax tendon with a hypoplastic muscle, it is a congenital superior oblique muscle paresis. If you get a restricted tendon with a hypoplastic muscle, you get a congenital Brown syndrome. So what are the associated abnormalities? You have congenital Brown syndrome associated with aplasia or hypoplasia of the superior oblique muscle. It can be associated with other congenital cranial dis disinnervation disorders like superior oblique palsy, a congenital one, Duvan's retraction syndrome, ptosis, congenital ptosis, jaw winking ptosis, and so forth. Congenital superior oblique palsy and congenital Brown syndrome can share inheritance, they can run in families, they can have bilateral manifestations, and they can be associated with other CCDs. How does Brown syndrome present? Brown syndrome can be congenital, that is present from birth, uh, acquired, which means onset later in life, unilateral in 90% of the patients, which with slight predilection to female population. Though congenital Brown syndrome is mostly sporadic, it can also be genetically inherited, but there is no single genome or loci which is found to be defective. 
so you cannot you know boil down to a particular gene defect as far as laterality is concerned it is the right eye that is more frequently involved than the other eye so this is a very interesting abnormality i told you the genital brown syndrome and the genital so palsy are interrelated at times but this is a case of congenital brown syndrome this congenital so palsy in the same eye of the patient without a tray trochlear nerve and this has been published in the boston case reports it's a child of chinese origin not much of vertical deviation in primary position there is defective elevation and adduction there is defective depression in adduction which means that there is a combination of both sop and superior oblique tendon trochlear complex you can see that this eye is completely normal the left eye is completely normal and there is a good nice trochlear nerve which is seen on the normal side with an absence of trochlear nerve on this side and a hypoplastic coincidentally there is also an hypoplastic superior oblique muscle complex as compared to the normal side so apart from congenital brown syndrome brown syndrome can also be acquired it can come later in life so what are the causes for acquired brown syndrome one is inflammatory etiology rheumatoid arthritis jogren syndrome systemic lupus erythematosus all these cause inflammation and fibrosis and thickening of the superior oblique tendon trochlea complex it can happen following trauma peribulbar block periocular surgery blepharoplasty multino implant sinus surgery where there is a scarring and shortening of the tendon there could be a cystic circus cyst in the superior oblique tendon which causes a slippage of the tendon complex sometimes there is a superior oblique tendon tuck surgery or a thyroid ophthalmopathy which causes a tightening of the superior oblique tendon and you can also have limitation to passive elevation and adduction because of a blow out fracture with entrapment fat adherence syndrome following inferior oblique surgery or even an inferior oblique addition syndrome which can happen after an inferior oblique surgery so these are called as adherence syndrome or pseudo brown syndrome and i will be dealing with pseudo browns or adherence syndrome towards the end of this talk so what are the symptoms of brown syndrome symptoms can be intermittent it can be recurrent and it can be also constant you can have any kind of presentation they have double vision there is poor binocular vision and stereopsis there can be orbital pain and tenderness pain with extraocular motility especially in acquired brown syndrome an abnormal head position like a chin up or head which is turned away from the affected side because you want to place that eye in abduction and not um, adduction a click or which can be heard or felt that the eye elevates in adduction so these are the way the symptoms are presenting and let's look at the way the patients present to us in the form of signs now what do you see here this is the nine gaze photo of a patient primary position looks perfectly normal there's no hyper or hypotropia but here in our case there's a pattern and what do you see in this position there is limitation of elevation and adduction as opposed to this side look at this side beautifully elevating and adduction but there is definite limitation of elevation and adduction here depression seems to be normal there is no down shift in adduction so this is indeed a brown syndrome but a very mild or minimal form of brown syndrome without hypertrophia and primary position without down shoot in adduction but there is a characteristic limitation of elevation in adduction there is a characteristic b pattern in up case let's look at another child what do you see here again there is a b pattern in up in elevation there is a limitation of elevation in adduction of the involved eye what do you see here there is an overaction of the inferior oblique in the contralateral eye what does the primary position show a hypertropia there is a small amount of mesotropia and there is a ptosis of the affected eye there is a down shoot in adduction in the 
affected eye. So basically, this is a more severe form of manifestation. Hypertropia, down shooting in adduction, ptosis, uh, limitation of elevation in adduction with a V pattern in upcase. So this is a more pronounced form of Down syndrome. So how do they present? These are the ways they present. Limited elevation in adduction, subtle limitation of elevation in upcase and abduction, Mild cases, there is no vertical deviation in primary position or down shoot in adduction. Moderate cases, there is no vertical deviation in primary position, but there may be a down shoot in adduction. Severe cases, you will get both hypertropia and down shoot in adduction. Characteristic V pattern. Remember this. There will be a characteristic V pattern, which is divergence on up gaze. Chin up posture or head turn away from the affected eye. Is the anomalous head posture this patients can present with widening of palpebral fissure adduction, drooping of the eyelid, but there is no superior oblique overaction. So these are the clinical features of Brown syndrome, which you need to remember and recollect when you see a child with these kind of abnormalities in extraocular mobility patterns. Now, what does this child looks very much like a Brown? Yes. There is a ptosis, there is hypertropia and a little sore adduction. But is there any B pattern? No, there is no B pattern in up case. There is limitation of elevation in adduction. But what is the pattern you see? There is an A pattern. So this looks so much like a Brown syndrome. But this is a very special case because this child had a combination of both IO palsy as well as a small kind of an acquired Brown syndrome. I will show you later in the course of presentation as to how I have managed this particular patient. So I am going to first tell you what are the characters. This is a combination of both IO palsy and Browns, acquired Browns. But IO palsy per se will have a characteristic A pattern because of superior oblique overaction. FDT will be negative. Superior oblique overaction will be present because of an inferior oblique palsy. In torsion will be present. Head tilt will be positive. So these are the differences between IO palsy and Brown syndrome. Brown syndrome, uh, there is a restrictive pathology because of a superior oblique tendon abnormality. So FDT will be positive. B pattern will be present. No superior oblique over uh, action. No torsion because there is no superior oblique overaction and head tilt test will be negative. So it's good to know these differences. Now let's look at this patient. These are the other differentials. You have a hypertropia, there is elevation which is limited in adduction, primary position and abduction. There is a increased action of the depressors. This is a thyroid or myopathy. Inferior rectus fibrosis and CFEO also can present in a similar fashion. Blowed fracture with entrapment can also have a similar picture. Double elevator palsy can also present similarly. The thing is they may be associated with congenital ptosis. So these are some of the differential. One differential is iopalsy. These are the rest of the differentials of Brown syndrome. And of course, please remember the myasthenia gravis, ocular myasthenia gravis can also mimic Brown syndrome. So you can just have a look. This is not typical like a Brown but you have a little ptosis with limitation of elevation as, as well as depression in adduction. Both are so some cure movements which can you know sometimes put in doubt as to whether it's a Brown syndrome. But this particular young lady had uh, in fact ocular myasthenia gravis, and this is how you record your findings: hypotropia with any horizontal deviation, primary position, up gaze, down gaze. Right gaze, left eye, left gaze, and what is your motility deficit in each position of gaze with the presence of overaction of muscles, with also your measurements in your head tips. So this will give you a good understanding of the uh, motility pattern and measurement in your diagnostic position, so that you'll have a better understanding in your surgical planning. So there are terminologies, Stabismus, full of terminologies. You should know about pseudo browns. Pseudo browns is because of path adherence blow up or anomalous orbital bands. 
This is restriction of ocular elevation reduction due to a pathology other than abnormality of superior oblique tendon or muscle. Inverted Brown syndrome is a mirror image of Brown syndrome where there is a depression. Uh, deficiency of depression in adduction. Browns is deficiency of elevation in adduction, whereas inverted Browns is just the opposite. You have deficiency of depression. This is because of a tight IO tendon, which can sometimes happen after surgery for a congenital Brown syndrome. True Brown syndrome is when you don't have a, uh, no hypertrophy and primary position or down the gaze. Brown syndrome plus is you have a hypertrophy in primary position or down gaze with a down shoot in adduction. So this particular test you should know, which is the force duction test of Guyton, because this will tell you how to find out a tight superior oblique tendon. And this is a very subjective test. So uh, you will have to do on many cases to get a hang of this case. First, I'm going to show you how to test for the vertical recti. You have to proctose the globe. This is the simple vertical recti FDT and move the globe up and down. So this will see whether there is any vertical recti uh, tautness. Now what you're seeing is for the oblique, you have to retropulse the globe and you have to intort the globe. So you will see the jump over the tendon or you feel the tautness of the tendon when you do the force duction test of Guyton. But what is the test I use is this beautiful objective toss and using the Mendes ring which was actually, it's an excellent article in Ophthalmology Journal in 2015, which is a quantitative intraoperative torsional force duction test. This is an objective test. So it is not a subjective test. So it's much better than you actually uh, do this. So you will have this Mendes ring. You mark the up. Then I'll show you, you again. You will mark the uh, 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. You intort and extort without uh, retropulsing the growth. And the first resistance you feel will be your measure of extortion and intortion on either side. And you can gauge the amount of, you know, intortion and extortion that is possible and draw your conclusions. So... This is the next important test which you will do, which is the neuroimaging. And uh, neuroimaging is very important. This is from a radiology case reports. Now you can see the inflamed uh, superior oblique muscle, which can happen in rheumatoid arthritis, or you can look at the trochleitis, both are neuroimaging. So neuroimaging is a must in almost all cases of acquired Brown syndrome or when there is a suspicion of acquired Brown syndrome. So how would you manage these patients? Observation, be conservative. Brown's is not a disorder where you can aggressively treat patients. Observe, observe, observe. Symptoms are intermittent and they do not cause per permanent damage. Even in congenital Brown syndrome, it is a spontaneous improvement in 75%. It is a mesenchymal differentiation of the superior oblique tendon trochlea complex, which gets better with time. And you can get spontaneous improvement in 75% of your patient. Acquired cases when inflammation resolutes, there's spontaneous uh, resolution. But sometimes you can give steroids to help with resolution of inflammation, which can be systemic. It can be combined with NSAIDs. If there is long-term inflammation, you may need to use immunosuppressives like adalimumab. And intratrochlear injection, which is very, very topical kind of, you know, looking at Brown syndrome, I mean, a very, uh, what do we say, less um, uh, complications. You don't have the systemic complications of systemic steroid. This is a very localized kind of looking at Brown syndrome using dexamethasone or triamcinolone. A very interesting article by Shashikant and Shetty, published uh, by Jeb in Jeffos, which is intraoclast steroid injection and acquired their case series of five to six patients using dexamethasone or betamethasone, and with good results has been published. And this is my own patient, which I showed you, that inferior oblique child with inferior oblique palsy combined with acquired brown. That child did have some enhancement of the tendon trochlea complex and I went ahead and gave this intratrochlear injection. Can be done under mild sedation. Not even intubation is needed. 
your 1 cc tuberculin syringe, you have, I'm using dexamethasone. Go a little medial, strike your medial orbital wall where your trochlea is present, and then withdraw and inject your steroid child. I started crying because very mildly sedated, but you can just finish off in a jiffy even before the child gets away. And once this injection is given, Let's look at this child. This is this primary position. There is hypotropia, there is ptosis, there's limitation of elevation and reduction. Post injection, see the improvement in primary position. There is some amount of improvement of elevation and reduction. But of course, this child had a combined inferior oblique palsy. That is why that elevation has not improved. Just when that trocleitis has got better. It's got a little better, but it's not completely because this was a combined case of IO palsy. You had an A pattern because of superior oblique. I'd shown you in the previous slide. So there was a partial response to trochlea injection. But in acquired trochleitis, this is a very good treatment modality. You might have complete resolution of the entire process with this steroid injection. So what are the indications for surgery per se? Hypotropia in primary position, significant AHP, significant double vision, significant down shoot, compromised binocularity, orbital pain or pain on motility. The surgery, as far as it is concerned, the lesser the better. Be careful when you touch the superior oblique muscle. It is not a pardonable muscle. If you create an hydrogenic superior oblique palsy after you operate, you are going to cause a permanent down gaze. Yeah. So you have to do control procedure. You need to do titrate triple procedure. So this is very important. It is not like you can cut and do a free tenotomy and get away with it in case of a Brown syndrome. There are two surgeries which I'm going to show you. One is a suture tendon spacer. So people usually use a chicken suture. But I use the mattress suture, which is a much simpler way of putting much faster surgery, quicker, titratable, and a very controlled procedure. Look at this. I hope the video is playing. Yes. So we have to hook the superior oblique muscle. First, I'm hooking the superior rectus, getting that intermuscular septum out of the way. Then hook the superior oblique muscle. It's a beautiful looking muscle. Look at that shining superior oblique tendon. Dissect that intermuscular septum. The sheath can also be removed. Okay, I'll be placing the mattress sutures. I'm just doing a little more dissection and free the muscle from the sheath. It's a beautiful muscle. It's an excellent feeling when you operate on the superior oblique muscle. But please do control procedures. So this is the mattress suture. It's a very simple way of doing. It's not at all complicated like the chicken suture. You, this I have hardly edited this video. The entire surgery is being shown almost unedited because that fast is the surgery. So. So once you have placed this mattress suture, remove these sutures out of the way. Remove it out of the way and then put your iris repositor underneath because you don't want to cut these sutures. Place it underneath and cut off this muscle. And now, see, this is the suture which is acting like a tendon spacer. Put your adjustable noose over this. You have a noose. You can increase the suture tendon spacer as much as you want. I have put about 4 mm of tendon spacing using the suture. If you want, you can make it 5. You can adjust it the next day. You can make it 6, depending on how much of weakening you want. So it's a beautiful procedure. And then you close off this uh, conjunctiva. Okay? So I'll go on to the next video. The next weakening procedure that you need to do is the split superior oblique tendon elongation procedure, which is again a very nice procedure. Another controlled procedure. Watch this video. 
use your desmeris retractor hook the muzzle under visualization don't do anything that is blind do controlled procedures i time and again i keep telling people in various uh, forums this mark your superior superior oblique muzzle 5 mm apart okay and then use your 60 vicral two uh two 60 vicral one in the upper temporal and one in the upper nasal lower temporal one suture the other will be in the upper nasal so once you have done this you will have to cut this tendon you're splitting and elongating the tendon that's all that is all that you are doing you are splitting and you are elongating the tendon okay and then you attach the tendon so you have split this tendon about 5 mm and once you reattach it becomes a 10 mm elongation so this is how much you weakened your superior oblique now tie these two ends such a simple beautiful surgery such a controlled surgery so you can elongate it by 10 12 depending depending on the amount of superior oblique weakening that look so this is that tendon after elongation and then you close up okay cut off those extra suture pipes and it looks very neat fast surgery just don't have to be scared of operating on any of the extra oblique muscle once your fundamentals are in place okay so now i have finished with brown syndrome conservative management is the key you can also go for surgical management case by case you assess your case and do control surgical procedures be very careful not to do your uh, superior oblique tenotomies and things like that because you can land up with hydrogenic esophagus arterial syndrome is something which i would like to talk in the second part of my talk which mimics browns it is a pseudo browns it can be because of fat adherence or inferior oblique adherence so this fat adherence syndrome is a progressive restrictive strabismus associated with intrusion of extra conal pad of fat into the subtenon space following surgery or trauma so there will be restriction of elevation uh in abducted position of the go globe as well as primary position abduction maximal in this position and uh, this is an interesting article by sandra dal and taylor and francis so look at these parts of fat be very cautioned cautioned while you operate these patients when you do an inferior oblique anterior positioning surgery so it was first described by park it's a restrictive ocular motility as i told you after io surgery after scleral buckling blepharoplasty any of these things infections traumas you can get it there is hypertrophy of the eye which is progressive limitation of elevation especially in abduction a positive fdt upper lid retraction and a very large excyclotropia so you can get various kind of uh, issues which causes soda browns one is fat adherence which i've already told you the other is anti elevation syndrome after inferior oblique anteriorization how do you differentiate it's a non progressive pathology early in onset unlike fat adherence which is little later in onset and the deviation is progressive it's quite stable you do a surgery you make that inferior oblique muscle an anti elevator and you get this anti elevation syndrome sometimes when you do lateral rectus surgery you can include inferior oblique thereby produce a hypertrophia but this is not very marked because the posterior or uh, the uh, it's only the anterior portion of the inferior oblique muscle which is included the posterior portion will be uh, you know not pulley the posterior pulley is not affected so it is not very severe inferior oblique adherence can happen because of inferior oblique scarring to the sclera this can be seen after post scleral buckling post inferior rectus surgery with or without inferior oblique surgery so this is the inferior oblique adherence syndrome so post scleral buckling sometimes you can include this inferior oblique muscle in your bucket 
buccal surgeons don't pay heed to uh, muscles and sometimes you can have tethering of the inferior oblique like this with stretching of the neurovascular bundle which again causes restriction of elevation and adduction you can have scarring of the inferior oblique muscle just after an inferior oblique surgery or even after some inflammatory process again causing an inferior oblique adherence syndrome and sometimes after inferior oblique weakening procedures when you hook the inferior rectus muscle also you can cause an inferior oblique adherence so it's better to hook the inferior rectus from the nasal aspect rather than the temporal aspect when you do an inferior rectus surgery post an inferior oblique surgery so this is how the inferior oblique anterior positioning is if i have time i will just show you so So I placed the interoblique at the incorrect position. Finish this. The anteriorization. This is like an anteriorization of this. Suppose you make the muscle very taut, or you weaken the inferior oblique muscle too much. What happens is it causes an anti elevation. you want this inferior oblique muscle which is an elevated in adducted position to become a depressor but in fact you will make it an anti elevator and you find that elevation and abduction can also be limited post an inferior oblique surgery then you weaken it too much or you anteriorize the posterior fibers of the inferior oblique or spread the posterior fibers too much all this will cause the neurovascular fibrous bundle of the inferior oblique to be put on stretch and cause an anti elevation syndrome so how do you manage the fat adherence syndrome fat adherence syndrome is not easy it's difficult not satisfactory you have to release the inferior oblique additions you have to reposition the inferior oblique muscle combine it with an inferior rectus recession sometimes also recess the conjunctiva bar if you have an inferior oblique adherence syndrome which i have already reiterated before in my talk it responds very well to surgical correction you have to release that inferior oblique and reposition the inferior rectus inferior oblique and also cause an ipsilateral inferior rectus recession i suggest you read this beautiful article by burton kushner who has talked very nicely about the inferior oblique muscle adherence syndrome it is a must read article by all post graduates thank you very much for your patient hearing i've come to the end of my talk this is my mail id in case you have any queries you can also drop in your mail thank you so much ma'am uh, indeed it was stop like just share i will stop yeah. the share just yes ma'am thank you so much ma'am uh, indeed an excellent talk on uh, this subject and pradeep sir was like really correct it was a pleasure to listen to you um any comments pradeep sir before we go on to the questions i think it was as expected a wonderful talk on brown syndrome which is otherwise uh, less understood and more difficult to uh, tackle so uh, dr manjula has very nicely covered this subject as well as the adherence syndromes which can be there uh so just to reiterate that uh, superior oblique palsy and brown syndrome can be sometimes seen in the same patient concurrently and we had published a case in jepos uh, long back in 2004 i think it was one of the earliest ones which uh, earliest that superior oblique palsy is not something uh, different it appears different but actually if you see it's the same and we had done an mri on uh, both the eyes and we had seen that 
there was a thinning of the supraoblique on both the side one side it becomes so fibrotic that it's like a brown syndrome the other one it gets thinned out and so acts like a supraoblique palsy so i think dr manjula had mentioned about such cases which are there so both are uh, could be possible but iatrogenically as she stressed sometimes we may create a supraoblique palsy in a person having a brown syndrome and i think it's very important to reiterate that point that uh, brown syndrome is a problem which can be uh, still uh, i mean accepted but if you create a supraoblique palsy it's more of a problem because in the down gaze then the diplopia comes in in brown it is only in the up gaze so your solution becomes worse than the problem so it's very important to do controlled procedures as dr manjula was describing there are several of them uh, expanders or you do a chicken neck suture or you do an adjustable uh, suture as dr manjula was showing uh, i personally usually nowadays do a hanging back loop tenotomy at the insertion site at the temporal site because i prefer to operate on the temporal side on the superior obliques a nasal side i feel is uh, likely to cause fibrosis in the longer run because this is a little more crowded area so if possible one can do a loop tenotomy hanging loop tenotomy which is there uh, she very nicely showed the exaggerated force duction test which should be done and one of the situations which can give rise to a uh, pseudo browns is a tight lateral rectus which may be having an exotropia along with a appearance of a brown syndrome and the classical differentiation would be that on in if there is a tight lateral rectus causing an up uh, problem in elevation it would be relieved by pushing it for backwards whereas a exaggerated force duction test you have to push it backward in order to make it more tight so i mean that is the distinction between the force duction test done for the recti and for the obliques so i think it was wonderful and acquired also she mentioned that we can use steroids or uh, immunomodulators in cases to uh, tackle these so i think if there are uh, any comment from dr abha uh, we would like to have uh, yes. dr abha yes um, sir it was really a very nice uh, presentation and she had shown all the uh, types of uh, brown syndrome like uh, uh, in one eye there was a brown another eye she had a brown's retraction syndrome and uh, presentation uh, uh, injection uh, in the, into the uh, trochlea it was mm -hmm. really very nice and uh, i just wanted to add one more point that i had two patients uh, they were mild syndromes and since there was no indication for surgery i just asked them to do a regular follow up and they automatically re uh, recovered so h h said that 75% uh, there is a recovery and uh, one more point i want to add that whatever you do uh, the calculated uh, surgery but the long term follow up is very essential uh, especially in a child because what happens sometimes there may be a superior oblique palsy type of uh, situation and there is inferior oblique overaction and if it is a hypertrophia in the primary position after surgery so they may develop amblyopia so regular follow up is very essential as she has mentioned previously also that she want to long term follow up the strabismus patients so that adds to that point and really very nice presentation and as it is the brown syndrome is very comparatively rare and uh, whatever i have seen uh, 10 13 patients in my this thing and right eye was a prominent only two patients i had a left eye brown yes thank you sir thank you for giving me the opportunity yeah uh so can i move on to the questions we have few questions from our viewers uh the first one is i think ma'am has discussed but quick pointers uh, in clinic to differentiate between browns and pseudo brown syndrome practical pointers to differentiate between browns and pseudo brown no uh, pseudo uh, pseudo browns is that uh, additions whatever you get the fat adherence and things like that those are the pseudo browns clinically they will look the same but you will have a history which will point towards pseudo browns like for example uh you might have had a orbital trauma or you would have had an inferior oblique surgery or something like that which will prevent it's a limitation of elevation passive elevation limitation of elevation and adduction passive limitation which occurs because of some kind of you know uh, entrapment or addition which is happening at the flow 
So those are the ones which are pseudo-brown. So history is the main factor. Of course, you can also do imaging species. Otherwise, cl clinically, they look the same. Brown syndrome and pseudo-brown syndrome will look the same. There will be limitation of elevation and adduction, which is uh, will be uh, sometimes limitation of elevation and abduction can also be present. Maybe you may not get these V patterns and down shoots and those kind of things. But basically, they will present with a limitation of elevation and adduction. Sir, anything you would want to add? Yeah, I think as Dr. Manjula is saying, it's correctly uh, described. Uh, basically, as for PGs, we would like to say the three criteria or three pillars for diagnosis of Brown syndrome should be a limitation of elevation in adduction, but almost a normal elevation in abduction on abduction and on straight up gaze, there is a divergence. So, I mean, to be more specific, it is more like a Y pattern rather than a V pattern because still the primary position, it may be okay, but the moment it goes higher, then it starts diverging because it is a slippage of the globe. Just like in Duane's, you have a slippage in this also there's a slippage on attempted up gaze so these three classical features will pick up a brown syndrome uh, there can be a differential diagnosis like a, a monocular elevation deficit or double elevator palsy as dr manjula was saying so those will have a elevation deficit even in abduction in uh, true browns you will usually have a cl clear elevation in abduction but a limited elevation in adduction and the divergence in upgaze, these are the two classical things that you should be seeing. Uh, there is a brown plus in which there may be a superior oblique overaction in addition. Uh, that also could be there. Now, as I also mentioned, one kind of situation could be a uh, tight lateral rectus, which can also give rise to an elevation deficit. Uh, as Deemer has described that there is a, a dystopia or hypotropic lateral rectus, which may be tight and that causes an elevation deficit. So that also may be presenting as that. But otherwise, the history will tell you that, yes, there has been an earlier surgery which has caused fibrosis, which will cause a pseudo brown -like. All right. Uh, so next one is uh, an anatomy question. Can you please explain the movement of superior oblique tendon within the trochlea? Mm -hmm. Just like a telescope, it keeps going through and forth, you know? And uh, it is a very smooth, beautiful movement. I don't think so. Uh, any other part of the body has gone this telescopic movement of a muscle through a trochlea. So as the you know the eye the eye muscle contracts, this movement is a very smooth slipping which will happen in and out, and that is actually restricted in Brown syndrome, basically because the mesenchymal differentiation of the tendon trochlea complex is affected. There is an abnormal innervation, congenital abnormal innervation of the fourth nerve because of hypoplasia of the fourth nerve. And therefore, the mesenchyme of the tendon trochlea complex doesn't differentiate properly. And therefore, it leads to a congenital brown syndrome with an extraocular motility disorder pattern, which we are seeing. But this mesenchymal differentiation can slowly keep happening. That is why even in congenital Brown syndrome, you find that improvement happens spontaneously with age and over a period of time. That is why I said even congenital Brown syndrome in 75% of cases, you can still have a resolution over a period of time. Okay. And if you want to know about the action, extraocular motility uh, of the superior oblique muscle, uh, basically, superior oblique muscle is a depressor in adduction. It is also an abductor and it is an implant. If you look at the primary action, it is an implant. It's a beautiful implant. The obliques are the daughters, basically. So superior oblique is an implantor. It also has secondary and tertiary actions like depression in adduction and some amount of abduction. Okay, is that clear? Yeah, I think I mean, that makes it clear. Uh, I'll move on to the next question. How do we differentiate between a tight superior oblique tendon versus a short superior oblique tendon leading to browns? And how different is our approach towards its management? Uh, that objective uh, torsion using the Mendes ring published in ophthalmology is a very, 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 very beautiful uh, test. 
you know it's the diagnostic test i don't do this post duction test of guyton at all i use only that test because that will differentiate everything now if you have a tight superior oblique tendon it is a brown syndrome but if you have a taut or in the inelastic inferior oblique tendon that is an inverted brown syndrome now that will also actually look you know somewhat similarly it can present i mean if you have a tight or a taut superior oblique tendon it causes deficiency of elevation depression in a deficiency of elevation and adduction because the superior oblique is pulling it down but if you have an inelastic inferior oblique tendon it causes a inverted brown syndrome and there will be limitation of depression in adduction just the opposite you will get now this objective torsion test you will intort as well as extort the group now even you do this objective torsion test and if your superior oblique tendon is tight on top you will find that you will not be able to extort the group so how much of extortion is possible 30 degrees so that normal extortion will be limited if you have a tight in elastic superior oblique tendon it will be limited to 10 degrees or 15 degrees at the same time suppose you have an inelastic inferior oblique muscle which is an inverted brown syndrome your intorsion will be you can make out that both extorsion and intorsion you can test with this so what is happening to your inferior oblique tendon what is inferior oblique muscle what is happening to your superior oblique muscle what will be the finding in brown syndrome what will be the finding in inverted brown syndrome all the inferences you can come so basically you have to do your force duction test of guyton to look for your taut tendon you can also do this objective extorsion and intorsion test to look at uh, abnormalities in your superior oblique tendon as well as in your inferior oblique because you get some situations like that where it could be something like an inverted brown how do you differentiate that then you will have to do these tests i think uh, the uh, question also had the differentiation between a tight superior oblique and a short superior oblique so yeah. i think that uh, so the short superior oblique is usually going to be there when there is a spasm or a, con a contracture of the superior oblique which is there in a browns plus so in that there will be a downshoot of the eye in adduction whereas if there is just a, a, a brown syndrome with a fibrosed uh, uh, superior oblique it will be uh, elevation deficit in adduction without any uh, plus overaction of superior oblique so it's not the brown plus as described by oh. jemplowski so the classical brown syndrome is having a fibrosed superior oblique which doesn't allow it to move the telescopic movement is disturbed but otherwise there is no superior oblique overaction whereas if there is a short superior oblique it will give rise to a hypotropia in uh, adduction even in the down gaze so i think that would be another differentiating feature in addition to the uh, test on exaggerated force duction test which will confirm a brown syndrome and about the management approaches to either sir like so how is a, a just a fibro superior oblique which is not having a superior oblique overaction then the surgery is described such a way that we do not create a superior oblique palsy in the absence of an overaction of superior oblique if you do a little more of weakness of the superior oblique we will create a superior oblique palsy that's why it's very important that we do uh, something which is controlled one at the time of surgery you can see intraoperatively the force duction to see that you haven't loosened the superior oblique too much one secondly there are procedures like stripping of the superior oblique which may which have been described in very mild uh, brown syndrome in which there is only the telescopic mechanism which is not allowing the uh, so, superior oblique to move but otherwise there is no uh, underaction of superior oblique in such cases just the stripping procedures or of the superior oblique tendon has been described i think by wells recently and that is another procedure which can be done for mild to moderate superior oblique uh, tightening without having an underaction of uh, so the the overaction of superior oblique so so overaction of superior oblique is important to have a weakness weakening procedure to be done otherwise you will create a superior oblique palsy the weakening is titrated suppose you don't have a superior oblique overaction which is present with the brown sesergy the weakening could be a mild weak suppose you're going to have a good superior oblique overaction along with the brown syndrome 
then uh, you have to weaken it more. So okay. better to do titratable procedures all the time. Either you have a chicken suture or match a mattress suture, which you can adjust intraoperatively as well as postoperatively, or you do your split tendon elongation. Don't do non-titratable procedures on superior oblique muscle because it's a non-forgiving muscle. You do it on children and you can land up with superior oblique palsy so easily and that can cause severe down gaze diplopia for the rest of the life, which is not treatable by you. So basically, you have to be very, very careful. It needs experience and you need to do a lot of cases to get a hang of it as to how much we can do you would. Uh, decides what to do it. And intraoperatively, keep doing it. At the end of the surgery, also do your force duction test of chitin or you do your objective torsional test, which I have uh, told. Either one of the tests you can see. And actually, uh, as I said, superior oblique tendon sheet syndrome, Brown syndrome, you cannot actually find out exclusively say, this is a top tendon or this is a tendon. It's a complex thing. Everything is present. Clinically, how are you seeing the patient? Do you have just a restriction of elevation and adduction, or are you having a downshoot and hypertrophia? That's that how you plus. cannot, uh, you know, make out this. This is a very complex pathogenic process. You cannot differentiate one from another. It's all merged together. Clinically, look at your patient and come to a decisive outcome. That's how you do. I think with that, uh, rest of the questions ma'am has beautifully covered in her talk. So again, thank you ma'am for spending the evening with us and uh, talking on this intriguing and uh, important topic for our postgraduate students. Uh, it's a pleasure and then always we learn from Dr. Pradeep Shatma sir. Always there are points for us to take back home and it's been a very, very uh, interesting and beautiful evening uh, spending time with all of you and for giving me this opportunity to reach out to postgraduates and budding pediatric Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Manjula. It's really a pleasure to listen to this uh, talk. And I think thank you, Dr. Abha, for joining with us this thank evening. You. Thank you, Shefali, for conducting it so nicely. Thank you, uh, it was really a pleasure. And we look forward to the next talk now. What is that, Shefali? Yeah, so next we'll meet on September 28th, that is uh, next Wednesday, with the special forms of strabismus and uh, some case examples by Dr. Sumita Agarkar. So coming Wednesday, see you all. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. So. Right. Take care. Enjoy your dinner. Bye-bye. Thank, so. Thank you, sir.